Hello, everybody. Welcome to a wonderful evening of readings as part of the Windfall Reading Series. My name is Wendy, and I work at the Eugene Public Library, and um, I'm thrilled that you can be here either live or perhaps you're watching this later, watching it again. Um, however you're here, we're glad you've made it because tonight's going to be spectacular. Before we start and before Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild speaks, I just have a couple quick things to say. First, a couple thank yous to the Lane Liter Literary Guild for sure. Thank you so much for being such an amazing uh, part of the community, for advocating for writers, for having programs and interesting events and um, allowing speakers and authors such as the two people tonight um, being able to come and, and, and speak to everybody. So thank you so much to the Lane Literary Guild. And thank you also to the Friends of the Eugene Public Library. Without this group of tireless volunteers, we would not have the programs we get to have, such as this one. The book sales that they do are amazing. I'm sure that if you spent any time in Eugene, you know how legendary they are. And the myriad other um, opportunities they allow people in the library, um, community members to experience library programs, and they are just fantastic. And they help enrich our, um, our collections as well. So thank you to the Friends of the Eugene Public Library. Uh, tonight, we are having two authors read their works. And uh, you are welcome to ask questions or make comments that we will be discussing and reading at the end of the program, so around 7 o'clock. So there are two different ways you can do that. One way is you can just write um, your comments below, just below the screen into the YouTube comment section, and they will be read at the end of the evening. So that's one possibility. You are more than welcome to email me as well if you don't really feel like showing your um, questions on uh, YouTube. Not a problem. Just email wbeck at eugene-or.gov. That's me. And you're welcome to use a pseudonym. You can uh, use no name, your name, whatever you'd like, and I'd be glad to read your comments or questions at the end of the reading. So either or is absolutely fine. You'll also find some uh, info just at the bottom about this and a few other things. And I had one other quick comment before Henry comes online. Just a little uh, save the date. The Eugene Public Library Foundation's annual benefit booked for the evening will feature one of our authors from this evening, Kim Johnson. So she's going to be our guest speaker. And this fundraiser is coming up on Saturday, April 23rd. And there's a lot more to uh, to it. Right now, this is just sort of a save the date because April evening. seems like it's far away. It's April not 23rd. really, but... Um, so let me get that info for you up instead. All right, there we go. So that will also be below as well. So eugenefoundation.org slash booked. And that's, um, it's a great evening of uh, conversation. You get to meet a lot of people in the community. You get to hear from fantastic authors and um, you get um, just a lot of of chance to, to communicate with other people who are also library supporters. So there you go. And let me get rid of that and bring up instead Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild. Hello, Henry. Hi, Wendy. Glad to be here. And uh, thank you for, again, all the support your library supplies to us. Um, I was president of the Lane Literary Guild back in 1986, and then again about 30 years later. So I bridge uh, quite a long area that tracks the development of our guild. Uh, it was founded in 1984. I was around then when Ingrid Wint and Bill Sweet had an idea for showcasing the various talents that we have in writing in our area. Uh, since then, it has been developing critique groups, and it's also been uh, a bastion of literary readings. Around 1990s, we developed what we call the Windfall Series, which was a pairing of distinguished authors from our area. And we would meet every month uh, from the months of September uh, on through till May. And we really feel privileged that the library has been so flexible as to allow us these virtual series, which has really been quite quite wonderful as well. Uh, the, the Guild has particularly featured 
um, highly imagetic poets and vivid writing uh, narratives uh, through fiction and creative nonfiction and memoir. And so we are really blessed tonight to have two people distinguished in those areas. One is Kimberly Johnson and uh, the novelist, and the other is Kelly Osborne, uh, our poet. So tonight we will start with Kimberly Johnson, and uh, Kimberly Johnson is a young adult author and vice provost at the University of Oregon. This is My America is her best-selling novel that explores racial injustice against innocent black men who are criminally sentenced and the families left behind to pick up the pieces. She is an award-winning novelist with 2021 accolades that include the Pacific Northwest Book Award, uh, YALSA Top 10 Best Fiction, NPR Concierge Best Books, Malka Penn Human Rights Award for Children's Literature, and the ILA Notable Books for a Global Society. This Is My America will soon be adapted as an HBO Max series and her upcoming young adult novel, Invisible Sun, will be released um, soon in fall in 2022. And I just want to say uh, I was struck so much uh, while reading her novel about how vivid and how moving just uh, one sentence can be uh, throughout the book. Uh, for example, when she's talking, when the narrator is speaking about her mother, uh, she writes this, the gospel music baptizing her the way it can rear inside your veins and cleanse your entire body, giving you goosebumps, making you raise your hands high. I mean, so much is just captured in the emotion of that. So it is uh, my privilege tonight to introduce Kim Johnson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Henry um, and Wendy and um, Windfall series of the Eugene Public Library for having me here today. I'm really looking forward to a reading from my novel. Um, and um, much of my novel has different formats within it. Um, it has an epistolary form with some letters and mostly chapters. And so um, I'm going to read the first um, entry, which is an epistolary letter. Uh, that my main character, Tracy Beaumont, uh, is writing. And I'll read from my first chapter and we'll see how good I am with time if I can dip in a few, a few, a couple scenes. So we'll begin. Dear Mr. Jones, my dad has precisely 275 days before his execution. You're the only hope we have because every lawyer we've used has failed us. In the last appeal, Judge Williams didn't take more than five minutes to consider. We mailed a renewed application since it's now been seven years. Please look into James Beaumont's application. We have all the court and trial files boxed up and ready to go. Thank you for your time, Tracy Beaumont. P.S. Jamal's going to college. Can you believe it? All that running added up to something. If you have those letters where I say he was wasting his time, please destroy them. P.S.S. Next Saturday at 10 a.m., Jamal's doing an interview on the Susan Turk show. You should check it out. Ready, set, go. Time runs my life, a constant measuring of what's gone and what's to come. Jamal's 100-meter dash is a blazing 10.06 seconds. That's how my older brother got this monumental interview. I'm not thinking about Jamal's record, though. I'm thinking about daddy's time, seven years, 2,532 days served to be exact. This running clock above my head's been in place since his conviction. That moment branded me. Mama gripped the courtroom bench to keep from collapsing as each juror repeated guilty. I looked to mama for an explanation. The empty look in her eye cried out the answer, death. Since then, it's tick-tock. Here at the TV station, Jamal rocks steadily in the guest chair, watching highlights of his track career with the producer during a commercial break. He glides his hands over his fresh barber cut, his mind more likely on the camera angles that'll best show his waves. We're true opposites despite our one-year difference. He's patient, calm, 
thinking, living, loving. He's everything on the outside I wish to be, bringing people in when nine out of 10 I'd rather push them out. That's why I hate that my mission crosses paths with the biggest day of Jamal's life. Five minutes and 37 seconds until showtime. As the commercial nears its end, I don't have to look up to know Mama's leaving the makeup room. The click of her heels echoes past a crew of engineers and radiates as she circles around Jamal to the guest seating area on the side of the studio stage. She enters like only a proud black mother can, hair all pressed and curled with a sharp black skirt suit that fits her curvy figure. Mama's been name dropping everywhere she can about the news anchor Susan Turk showcasing Jamal as a top athlete. I expected a live audience, but the set is a small studio and crew. I look out to Susan Turk's interview desk with the backdrop image of Austin, the state capital. They pulled out a white couch so there's space for my family to join Jamal at the end. Mama smiles at Jamal, then at my little sister, Corinne, but I swear she throws me some silent shade my way. Her not so subtle warnings have been going on for the past month. She knows I want daddy's story to seep out, but mama has made clear there is no room for daddy on this occasion. Not because she don't love daddy, but because she wants Jamal to have a clean slate at college as Jamal, not Jamal, the son of a murderer. If it was a few years ago, I'd understand, but daddy's got less than a year, no extensions, no money for more appeals. While time uncoils itself from daddy's lifeline, she's forbidden Susan Turek from mentioning him too. The show agreed not to talk about daddy in exchange for Jamal showing up. And if Susan tries anything, mama says we'll straight up leave. Mama stands by me and leans near my ear. Tracy, ain't it something to see your big brother's hard work paying off? Mm Mm-hmm, I say even though I'm still hoping the journalist and Susan can help but fling open Pandora's box on live television. Mama won't be able to stop it then. Then our truth can breathe free. The fight for daddy's appeal won't be in vain. People will finally hear the truth. Wake up to the fact that Lady Liberty has failed us, failed so many others. Angela Heron floats into the room with a twinkle of excitement in her eye. Her long blonde hair bounces with an unstoppable future. Angela's a new production intern for the Susan Turk Show. Even though she's only a senior in high school, weeks away from graduating with Jamal's class. It's no coincidence that her dad owns hair and media back in Gallatin County, where Jamal's worked the past two years. She'll always have it easy. I've worked my ass off to be in the running for the school newspaper editor next year just Maybe I can get into college internships early. Meanwhile, she's already advanced to a position most college grads can't get. Nervous? Jim- Angela asked Jamal. Nah, Jamal foot taps as he tries to play it cool. You got this. Angela hands Jamal a sheet of paper. Here are the questions Susan asked the other guests. Thanks, Ange. All the other interviews have the common thread of compelling American stories. A boy who battled cancer, an almost career-ending torn ACL, a girl hiding her gender at football tryouts. Each story a tearjerker. I'm hard-pressed to believe that they leave out what's at the heart of Jamal's dedication, what he's had to overcome. I glance over at Jamal's shoulder and skim the questions, looking for my window of opportunity. Tracy, Mama says, give your brother space. Hater, I step closer to Mama. Angela goes over a few pointers before I can ear hustle more. Angela's boyfriend, Chris Brighton, enters with a large box of donuts that appear tiny in his hands. Chris is still built out from his season, his strawberry blonde hair tucked under a Texas A&M hat with his jersey number, 27 stitch on the side. He'll be playing there next year. Just like at school, he barely acknowledges us. I'm going to skip forward just a little bit. Um, Jamal joins us, his arm now around Corinne, who's dressed in a striped yellow church dress. I chose a simple black A-line dress. My hair in an updo, sleek edges, and curls all out like a crown was placed on top of my head. 
the camera cuts away from Susan and they play a video of the four athletes they spotlighted in May. It's starting, Corinne nudges Jamal before clapping like there's a live audience, crumbs flying everywhere. Jamal chuckles and joins in with Corinne. I can't help but let a smile slip and I clap softly because Jamal deserves this. The last of the footage includes Jamal's records rolling up the screen. He's compared to competitive world athletes with Olympic gold medals. Then they show Jamal's last track meet of the season where he beat the boys high school track record, tying the long spanning 1996 college record. I feel like I'm there again. The crowd cheered so loud it shook the bleachers. You know something special was about to happen. Jamal dropped his knees and the scoreboard confirmed the new record. You know what you're gonna say, Corinne asked. Do I know what I'm gonna say? Jamal bends down to Corinne so he can whisper. You got advice from me, baby sis? Don't say, um. I burst out a laugh and cover my mouth when mama nudges me. That all you got? You say I'm a lot when you're nervous, Corinne shrugs and takes on his hands. You hear her, Tracy? Jamal elbows me. I don't say um a lot. Mm, you kind of do, I smirk. Yo, you wrong for saying that right before my interview. You know it's going to be stuck in my head now, right? Yep, I say. Um, um, Corinne joins in. We sound like a chorus at the side of the stage. Knock it off now, girls. Mama wags her finger at us. Angela cuts between us, gesturing for Jamal to follow her onto the stage studio while we take a seat off stage. Jamal gives her a wink when she wishes him good luck. Her cheeks go pink. He can always make someone feel special. Daddy says he's got a heart of gold. I just wish he hadn't thrown it around so easily. I watch Chris in the shadows, white privilege at its finest. Today, he's exhibiting classic toxic masculinity. I can tell Angela doesn't want him here, but he's too arrogant to think different. He acts at Wayne's school too, like he could get away with anything since his dad is sheriff. Poised and ready, Susan Turk faces the camera marked NBS1. She looks like all the white newscasters they have at the station, except the rotating weather girls of color. Susan's dressed in a white blouse and a gouty necklace of choice for the day. Her silky black hair is coiffed in a bob around her fake tan skin. <coughs> Excuse me. And pink lipstick matches the color of her glasses. The crew shifts into movement. The spotlight zooms in. The producer gives her a hand signal near the teleprompter. A green light blinks, and Susan plashes on a smile, on cue. The music begins. My heart now beats at a rapid pace. Reporting live here at NBS World News, if you're just tuning in, we've been highlighting top scholar athletes across the country. I had the pleasure of introducing a local star, the number one track athlete in the state of Texas, soon to be high school grad, Jamal Beaumont. Jamal's dark brown skin shines as he flashes a smile. Sits, um, as he flashes a smile, sits lean and tall in a closely tailored dark blue suit, white shirt and red tie he saved up for so mama wouldn't worry about the cost. The camera loves him. My stomach twists because I need the interview to bring attention to daddy's case, but it'll take away from Jamal. I hope he'll forgive me once he realizes what I'm trying to do. Bring daddy home, alive. When did you first start running? Susan leans forward and rests her hand on her chin. The same way she begins every interview. You're gonna have to ask my mama because I swear I came out running. Mama laughed, nudging me then mouth. It's true, it's true. I chuckle. Mama's loving every second of this. When you're not running, you're also working at a local radio station and have your own show Thursday evenings. Yes, I love it. I, I'm planning to major in communications and media. One day you could be interviewing me. Mm, that's my sister's thing. I'm more behind the scenes, audio engineering, brains and brawn, huh? He gives her a modest, a modest smile. Susan eats it up. Do track stars run in the family? There's usually more than one, am I right? Jamal swallows, stopping for a millisecond. But I'm sure only Mama and I notice. The men in the family have those genes for sure. Jamal's talking about Daddy. 
before we moved to Texas. Daddy had his own track glory days in New Orleans. His name kept his hometown business afloat in tough times with customers wanting to help him out. After the flood, all that was lost. People left and the local history was forgotten. Life was still hard a decade after Hurricane Katrina. So when Hurricane Veronica hit, we also left for good. We evacuated Texas, but daddy never ran again. During his trial, they said it was his speed that caught him all the way across town so quick. Daddy's fast, but he's not Superman fast. I watched Jamal, nervous with how he'll handle this. Well, they must be proud, Susan says. He is, Jamal hesitates after he says he. He looks directly into the camera and I smile at his secret way of acknowledging daddy and his ability to sidestep additional questions is impressive. Jamal's not gonna like that I let this interview go down like that. I'm both proud and nervous. I bite my lip, regretting that I tried all week to persuade him to use this as an opportunity to talk about daddy's appeal. Now Jamal's guarded, each word carefully crafted to avoid daddy coming up. One thing I love about highlighting you, Jamal, is that you could have chosen to go anywhere in the country, but you chose Baylor. Everyone thought you were going to track town, Oregon or North Carolina. Why Baylor? I'm a mama's boy, plain and simple. Got my two sisters over there, Jamal points to us, and I can be home in less than four hours if I need to. What can I say? I'm sure your family loves that you'll be close. Let's bring them out now. Angela leads Mama to the stage where she sits next to Jamal. Corinne squishes in and I end up at the edge of the couch. The hot lights beam down on me. I'm dizzy now with one thing on my mind. The thing everyone here is thinking about. The thing that hasn't been said, but that's boiling near the surface. Let's meet your sister Corinne. Corinne's round face immediately goes blank. Her eyes bulge like they're about to pop. How old are you, Corinne? Seven. You love your brother? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to be real sad when he goes off to college. I bet you are. What's special about your brother? Mm, he's fast, and when he packs my lunch, he always leaves me notes. I'm going to miss that. What kind of notes? Mm, nice stuff, Corinne pauses, like... If he knows I'm worried about something or trying to be funny, like, smile, I'm watching you, big head. Susan laughs awkwardly. It's okay if he says big head, Corinne shoots me a warning. Only he can say it, though. I chuckle because she's told the world her nickname from Jamal, and now he'll have to triple his notes to her. Or on Mondays when I'm real sad, he always leaves me a note like, I love you more than the sun. I keep all those. Her voice has a heaviness to it no seven-year-old should have. The thing that goes unsaid in our family, that missing pieces of us that keep us down because we only see daddy an hour on Saturday or Monday. Tracy, Susan tries to stay upbeat. You're a year behind Jamal. Are you also an athlete? College players? I used to do track, I pause, looking at Corinne, and then go for it. I'm a school journalist and organize Know Your Rights workshops in the community. Mama digs her finger into my side. I have to grind my jaws together to keep a smile. Susan's face is expressionless before she turns to Mama. Mrs. Beaumont, what do you think about your son? I'm so proud of Jamal. Anyone would be lucky to have him. He's respectful, dedicated, charming. There's no one like him. I've definitely picked that up. Susan rests her hand on her chin that your husband is real proud too. He is, Mama gives a tight smile. Three minutes left on the show clock. My chest floods like I'm being filled by water. Time's almost up. Susan has opened the door to talk about Daddy. I know what hurts Jamal will hurt Mama, but we all want Daddy home. I can't let this opportunity pass us by. I speak before Susan asks Mama another question. College seems so distant because I've been focused on helping my father's appeal. Mama parts her lips. A small gasp escapes. Jamal flinches and it's like a wave has come crashing down over the entire interview. 
Jamal, Susan turns to my brother, is this what influenced your decision to stay close to home? Jamal's expression goes blank. Susan keeps going when Jamal doesn't want to answer. Because your father is in Polanski prison. I watch him, hope this pushes him to speak on daddy's innocence, but he's staring past the camera like he wants us to be over. Not too long a drive from Baylor to see him or your family. Susan uses her hands like there's an actual map. Jamal stays composed. I couldn't find a reason in the world to go somewhere else. I wouldn't want to miss any time with my pops, moms, Corinne. Jamal gives me a once over. My dear sister, Tracy, shame runs through my veins when Jamal singles me out. I can imagine, Susan says, you don't get that time back. Every week counts. She's wrong. Every second counts. Now, your father, how long has he been sitting on death row? Sitting? Why do people say sitting? Like he's waiting patiently in line with a number in his hand. Yes, ma'am. He's, um, Jamal shoots a look at mama. He's starting to flounder. The crew is buzzing, scrambling at the breach of contract. He's been um, uh, on death row nearly seven years since the conviction, Jamal says. Inside, I scream out in joy that he doesn't skirt the issue. Must be painful. A lot of pain felt from him missing in our lives. Jamal pauses when his gaze is caught on Mama. I'm sure there's a lot of hurt, of course, from the families who lost the Davidsons that night. Daddy's innocent. Why did he say it like that? But I take all that and train, I run, I care for my family, I work, I live my life fully because my dad can. I don't need to be at a big track school, not when things that matter is putting in work to help take care of my family. That's something I can control. No one can beat me. Jamal gives a shy smile, slows down his rapid pace of talking. In my head, I mean, everyone has to lose sometime, but in my head, I can't lose because I'm growing with each race. Your dedication's a rare trait, Jamal. Thank you, ma'am. I don't let things get me down. That's why I'm so glad you highlighted me and we can focus on my accomplishments. Jamal smiles, unaffected by her prodding questions. I almost believe him. Must be hard, though, she puts her delicate hand on her chin again. Your father's death sentence, having to start over from New Orleans, and then the challenges in Texas. Texas is home now. I plan to keep it that way. Jamal keeps his fake grin. It aches to watch Jamal hold his composure. He's avoiding the topic as best as he can. Mama scowl says she'll slam it shut if Susan tries her. How long does your father have on death row? Susan's voice goes low. 267 days. I say it because knowing how long daddy has left is the air I breathe. Time to live, to appeal to turn back time. Mama whips her head at me. The camera follows. 267 days, Jamal repeats. That's why we want to keep our family together and focus on the good. Yes, Susan touches Jamal's shoulder this time. I can't imagine how hard it must be having your father in prison. Convicted of a double murder, unimaginable. Our father is innocent, I say. He's been trying to appeal, but we don't have the financial resources to prove his innocence. I've been waiting to write Innocence X to take daddy's case. They represent people wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death, especially those in underserved communities, people who can't afford bail, let alone an attorney with a team of expert witnesses to prove their client's innocence. After seven years of letters and no response, I'm getting Innocence X's attention today. If your father is innocent, I'm sure the system will work. No, I say, the system has failed us, continues to fail us. I don't know much about the details of his case, but we can talk after the show since we've reached the end of the interview time. Jamal, what would you, she's cutting me off. I can't let her take this time away from me. I haven't said enough. I stand so the camera is forced to focus on me. Do you know how many men have been put to death who were later exonerated post-mortem? I point to the camera. What about conviction rates by race and class? The system works if you have the money to defend yourself. Backstage, the crew creeps to the edge of the stage. My legs are jello underneath me. 
I'm close to collapsing right here, so I form a fist that fills me with courage. My father is innocent, and we have the evidence, but not the legal support to appeal his case. There are hundreds, thousands of cases like his, innocent people sentenced all the time. Susan's spider-like eyelashes blink rapidly. Her legs point toward Jamal because she knows this should be his interview, but the journalist in her focuses on me. What evidence do you have proving your father's innocence? The producer throws his arms up in frustration. He, has home, he was home all evening, I say. You were young then. I'm sure it's hard to remember. I barely remember what I had for lunch. That's not something you forget, ma'am. A small town with a double murder, everyone locked in the memories of where they were that day. He was home, Mama interjects, even though I know she's angry at me. This interview today is about Jamal, but I can't sit here and not defend my husband. He is innocent. Then who do you suspect killed the Galveston couple? Mark and Kathy Davidson were murdered, but not by my father or his business partner, Jackson Ridges. Other suspects have been recently identified, I say. Mama's and Jamal's expressions turn hard. I know Mama doesn't like when I lie, but we need to catch Innocent's ex's attention. Unfortunately, the Galveston Police Department refused to look into them, but we will find a legal team to represent my father's case. As soon as the interview is over, Jamal jumps out of his seat. Tracy, Mama gets her hand on her hip. Susan Turk steps between us, along with the producer. She blocks my view of Mama, but not before I witness how upset she is. This is unacceptable, Mama says. We had an agreement. I stayed within my parameters, Susan says. Your daughter, Mama puts her hand up to me as I draw in closer to join the conversation. Her gesture is instantly sobering. This won't be the time or place to talk to Mama. She won't listen to a word I say. I want this to be a moment to celebrate because I did what I planned. But to everyone else around me, this isn't a celebration. I'm standing in the rubble of a building I blew up. I follow Jamal, who is now in the hallway with Angela. His response isn't what I expected. I want him to be upset with me, to shout, to yell, anything to help me figure out how to approach him, but he doesn't budge. Give me a second, please, I start. I don't want to hear it. Jamal walks back to the studio. I turn my head to find Mama. Angela stands in my way. You're so selfish. You think you know everything, but you don't, she says. My father's innocent. I turn away from her. It's not just this. It's the same thing with the school paper. Always about you and what you want to do. Think about how Jamal must feel. Angela shakes her head and storms out the exit doors. The Texas heat sucks the air out of my lungs until the door shuts behind her. Mom is no longer on the stage. The only person left is Corinne. She hasn't moved from the interview couch. She's crying. Jamal gets to her first. A sob builds in my throat watching them. Jamal sinks down to his knees and wraps his arms around her waist. I stand awkwardly behind him, wanting to help, but knowing I did this. Corinne puts her arms around Jamal's neck, her tears wetting his collar. The hurt I force onto my family knocks me backward as I look down at Corinne's searching eyes. Everyone is angry. Corinne says. Jamal brushes her hair back. Sometimes people do things that hurt because they think they're helping. I shut my eyes and hope it's not a lie. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and as I, as I read that very long chapter, um, I think that is all the time I'm, I'm allotted today, but I appreciate you listening in. Thanks so much, Cam. That was very moving, and I really appreciate your sharing it. Um, we will now move on to uh, to Kelly Osborne. And um, but prior to just prior to one thing, I want to say is we do have a, a reading at the River Road uh, coming up, uh, the River Road Reading Series, which will be on January 29th, which is a Saturday, and uh, this is. Um, it says, we will break our in-person fast to present poetry by Eric Muller, Scott Lubbock, and Quentin Hallett. Uh, if you do come to the River Road Annex at 4.30 p.m. on Saturday, January 29, 
please do bring your vaccination card and do wear your mask. Um, they are going to be celebrating um, their own poetry, that is uh, Scott Lubbock and Quentin Hallett, but they'll also be celebrating uh, Eric Muller, who passed away recently, and his uh, wide variety of poems. So we want to let you know about that. Okay, then moving on to Kelly Osborne, and I want to say it's so nice uh, also to uh, present Kelly. She she has been such an important part of the Wayne Literary Guild for such a, a number of years. And um, it says Eugene resident Kelly Osborne writes lists, letters, testimony, and short essays. Her poems have been published in the Timberline Review, San Pedro River Review, The Fourth River and Passenger, and several anthologies, including All We Can Hold, Poems of Motherhood, Nasty Women Poets, an unapologetic anthology of subversive verse, and The Absence of Something Specified. She's slowly assembling a hybrid manuscript of poetry and prose, um, interrogating centuries of family inheritance. Uh, Kelly has worked as a newspaper reporter, communication specialist, and instructor in higher education, manager in local government, a mediator, and multi-purpose volunteer. In the past, she helped coordinate the Windfall series. About the future, she makes few claims and chooses hope. And um, I just wanted to say about Kelly's poetry that she, you know, can capture so much in one startling phrase. Um, for example, uh, in one of her poems, she writes the phrase loudly gold and uh, loudly red and gold, which I think is so vivid. And in her poem about St. Petersburg, she captures a whole city in one line, violence haunts each beautiful stone. Um, so again, I'm privileged to introduce our next reader, Kelly Osborne and her poetry. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Wendy. And um, thanks, Kim Johnson. Great to be on the slate with you tonight. I was uh, so happy to be able to read your book. Um, I'm excited and nervous to be here. So let me get going. Before I read some of my own poems, I just want to share this 2012 poem from Camille Dungy, Characteristics of Life. A fifth of animals without backbones could be at risk of extinction, say scientists, BBC Nature News. Ask me if I speak for the snail and I will tell you I speak for the snail. Speak of underneathness and the welcome of mosses, of life that springs up, little lives that pull back and wait for a moment. I speak for the damselfly, water skeet, mollusk, the caterpillar, the beetle, the spider, the ant, I speak from the time before spinelessness was frowned upon. Ask me if I speak for the moon jelly, I will tell you one thing today and another tomorrow, and I will be as consistent as anything alive on this earth. I move as the currents move with the breezes. What part of your nature drives you? You and your cubicle ought to understand me. I filter and filter all day. Ask me if I speak for the Nautilus and I will be silent as the Nautilus shell on a shelf. I can be beautiful and useless if that's all you know to ask of me. Ask me what I know of longing and I will speak of distances between meadows of night blooming flowers. I will speak the impossible hope of the firefly. You with the candle burning and only one chair at your table must understand such wordless desire. To say it is mindless is missing the point. So now onto my own poems. I wanna say at the outset that I do touch on uh, trauma and suggestions of violence, but nothing explicit or graphic. Um, a nod to writer Elizabeth Colbert on this poem, Extinction. Complaining of leaves, neighbors last week cut down three maples, sawed off every limb, branches fill their yard now, inviting squirrels going nowhere. Above my house, crows chatter for hours. Have they heard about the Hawaiian cousin, oblivious to possible mates, seamen coaxed by human hand for feathered issue? When great elephants fall to poachers on the East African savanna, does the earth tremble? 
Shallow graves scar the ground where gentle tusks lift the dead, survivors grieving motionless kin. Snowdrop, rosewood, wolemi pine, disappearing. We are the asteroid this time. A final wave of bright yellow frogs lives in a zoo, cast from the cloud forest of Eden. Our windows fasten against thickening air while machinery purrs through the walls. When a man presses a child to the ground in the park, I look again, lovers in the grass, ensnared, all animals fumbling in daylight, each of our bodies a refuge, a bullseye. Higher ground. We were talking about the folly of babies, folly of making love to the future. We've watched big people wrap small people like burritos, fetch small people to picnics and parties, send small people to stomp across puddles. Big people placing wildflower seeds onto small palms to scatter a promise. The babies grin until their faces illuminate stars among spectators. The babies mew and a hundred breasts leak milk on the spot. An old story for a New Testament this begetting, infants burrowing into our necks, hooking us dumb, big people spawning more despite everything. Despite coral reefs and hurricanes, salamanders and bullets, despite relations breaching borders, our edges invented, erased, redrawn. Each day's report chance disaster, roars brimstone, I've read the last chapter, every mountain and island displaced, skies a tight scroll, tribulation. My son says to get a grip that the babies could rise to rewrite the story. And I wanna embrace this hope, believe in deliverance, that people will blaze a way through a world burning. After the last storm, we hauled brush, built a fire break. We could have lain in bed like the corpses will become, but scrubbed clean for a cafe. The gentleman serving drinks, a foursome laughing nearby, Stevie Wonder's voice in the air all around us. Everybody beautiful, everyone a flare. And, um, with thanks to Cold Mount Review, teaching myself. A friend asked what I was doing to save the world and I said, organic bananas. He looked at me as if I were a yellow crescent and asked again what I was doing to save the world. So I said, reusable bags and shorter showers. He asked a third time and I offered hybrid automobile. Seriously, he sighed with the deflated sound of a bad inner tube. What are you doing to save the world? Well, I told the air around his shoulders. I write checks to good causes and vote, load scraps in the compost bin, keep a cold house. What do you want? I've got garden and clothesline, library card, my thrift store closet. I piled on smart light bulbs, that sign in the yard. I thought he was gonna lose it. He had cartoon steam ears, sealed lips, looked straight into my face and asked once more what I was doing to save the world. Our sky was soft gray, a cool pillow. Juncos, starlings darted about. In the shrubs, a red-breasted finch. I was missing the point, I know, stood suddenly small. I'm teaching myself to play the ukulele, I told him have no idea what I'm doing. So a little background before this next poem. On uh, October 8th, 1871, same day as the Great Chicago Fire, fire also um, struck in Wisconsin and destroyed in two hours a swath of forest 10 miles wide and 40 miles long raising the towns of Peshtigo and Brussels, killing more than 1,500 people. Among the survivors, 
my four-year-old great-grandfather. Autumn crown. Scent of smoke, tang of ash, fire, fire to handle slash. Too parched the marshes for canoes, too thirsty for wild rice. Trees and grasses, wooden houses, wooden sidewalks, tinder dry. October night, a crown, the rumble. Sound of a great threshing machine. Blaze the weight of an anvil. Gale leaning into gale, the wells and cellars keening. And rushing, amber sky rushing, storm upending stars. Inferno hurling, driving to the river those who could walk, run, could pick up children, babies, cattle frantic, trampling horses, and a man carries his wife to safety into water until flames pass over, until flames ignite the other side of the river, burning, burning, until she isn't his wife at all, but another's. Enduring the taste of charred air. Now's the time for you to take a drink of water too. My father gives up his guns. My father gives up his guns, deer rifles, pistols, semi-automatic blast off. When the latest revolver jammed inside his shaking hands, he laid it in a cardboard box like a small and wounded bird. On scratch paper, he scrawled names of offspring, in-laws, grandkids, heirs to collateral booty. Everybody gets a piece. Down to souvenir ammo, he clutches a cartridge of dreams. My father gives up his guns, but not the car keys, lurches from the driver's side, leans on the door with a heave, does just fine, he says, when my mother rides shotgun, says this as she lies on a hospital bed, wired to a pole. He's not joking, and still I laugh, despite his metronome steps, right, left, right in the hallway. He gives up his guns, but saddles the riding mower, his putt putting bronco. The wide green lawn calls, breeze blooming yellow. He tumbles on dismount, a blade to repair, shins to wipe. His signature shrinks more each day. Prune juice dots the morning floor. He can't decipher the phone. No longer whiz-bang, he's vibrating trigger. Yeah, my father surrenders his guns, the moon, stars. He's the solitary bullet in his chamber. So uh, a funny thing about creation, writing a poem, or I suppose doing a painting or anything, but um, for me, writing a poem, um, can start in one place and take me somewhere else, which is certainly true for this next one. Um, not where I, not where I began. In our sights, this is for the people of Christchurch, New Zealand, and um, so many others. In our sights, I'm losing my eyebrows, and I'm increasingly blank. Hair by hair falls without sound like pills slipping through a hole in my pocket, like dead skin cells or small teeth adrift. Deforestation, this bareness overtaken my face. How will my favorite punctuation rise in doubt, crease with thought when my eyebrows finally vanish? They're as much mine as the marbles my brother nicked from a drawer to trade for comic books years ago. I took revenge, dropped a glob of mayonnaise in his milk glass, his look of disgust, a sweet delight, my Aggies and Tigers lost forever. Vanity doesn't fully explain my bond to eyebrows, these temples that framed my mother 
and her mother, the lineup of 11 siblings with matching foreheads, ancestors up the ages, amused or stern, defined. Without dark archways, how will I know I come from people? Am I wrong to whinge about withered eyebrows when purple crocus blanket my yard and small birds peck at my window? When 50 worshiping Muslims lie dead in mosques on the other side of the world? I hear the gentle breeze of the first celebrant's greeting. Hello, brother. Hear the tenderness in hello. See arms extending and embrace. I picture fragments of us washing past in a river to a new forest of complete and shiny people. Remember how I slid into the Virgin River after a long, dusty hike. The water stopped beneath my chin and I beckoned to others. How open the world in our sights. How great the horizon. Hello, brother. Hello, sister. Hello, hello, hello. And now a pandemic makes its appearance, lifting my child. On the 51st day of the emergency, Lynn brought homemade donuts, sugar dusted puffs she left on my stoop in exchange for a slim book of poems about donuts. On the 84th day, she returned with scones and a note saying she'd expected something different from my gift, donuts being happy things. Who would have thought the whole could be a metaphor for the universe sucking us all into some unfortunate place, she wanted to know. I sipped my hot coffee, walked into the garden, Apple trees grew surrounded by Rebecca about to open black faces. Chard bolted into seed under the sun. I knelt on the ground, laid hands on the soil. I imagined joyful moments, my niece's daughters playing in dirt, feeding dolls, fixing wagons, touching everyone, grabbing everything, each resembling her great grandmother my mother, in that slant of a gaze. I remembered lifting her, my mother, wetting her mouth. Oh, mom, she called. Life's mist leaking away. She wasn't wrong, crying out like that. What any child might say at the end. So um, a little background, um, some of you may know this. Uh, on May 30th, 1948, the Columbia River burst through a dike obliterating Vanport, Oregon, which at one time was our state's second largest city. Tens of thousands were left homeless and a reported 15 people died. So Pantoum for my mother's lost city. The last Sunday in May was sunny and warm, lakes swollen, rivers filling with snowmelt. Children played in fields and went to the movie. Households bustled like a spring unwound. Lakes swelled, rivers filled with snowmelt when rain soaked marshland acres for days. Households bustled like a spring unwound. Why uproot thousands of people? As rain soaked marshlands for days, Officials cleared out equipment and files. Why uproot thousands of people living in a provisional city? Officials cleared out equipment and files, moved 600 horses from the racetrack nearby. After all, who lived in the provisional city was promised a warning, enough time to leave. Moving 600 horses from the racetrack nearby a person could get turned around in a floodplain. There'd be the warning with enough time to leave. Those left behind had no need for excitement. A person could get turned around in a floodplain, 
lose direction with a low town's horizon. Those left behind had no need for excitement, unaware of the small hole than the breach. Losing direction with the low town's horizon, refugees scattered, neighbors died. At first unaware of the small hole then breach before floodwaters toss buildings like toys. Refugees scattered, neighbors died, only 35 minutes to grab hands and escape. Floodwaters toss buildings like toys after finally the afternoon siren. Just 35 minutes to grab hands and escape to start over again, try to find a new home. After finally the afternoon siren urged a scramble to different ground. They'd start again, try to find a new home where children could play and go to the movies. They'd scramble on different grounds. That last Sunday in May was sunny and warm. And I'll just add that if you're not familiar with the Vanport story, uh, I encourage you to seek it out. It's amazingly relevant. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tale of official malfeasance of racism, of antipathy for poor people. Um, and it's a story of survival and resilience. And uh, thankfully, my mother survived. Um, this next poem is a Sononisio. It's a form devised by Kim Adonisio in which you borrow a line from another writer's sonnet and then repeat a chosen word in multiple ways from that line in each of the lines of your new poem. So my poem borrows from Ada Limon's instructions on not giving up. See if you can hear the repeated word to detonate. Sononisio on a line from Ada Limon. Unfurling like a fist to an open palm, I'll take it all. I'll bite the apple fallen, taste the open wound that seeps into my mouth, such sweetness. Open my veins, spill joy and sorrow until I am finally open hearted. Give me the open ocean. I'll run until my feet touch only water. Deliver an opening in the forest, shaft of life understory. I've watched the swifts plunge into the open chimney on Agate Street. The twitter, rush of wings, their propensity for return. I want to reopen a hundred conversations, furious noise of reconciliation, want to detonate an unopened portal. No open book, I'd be the damned library, humming, lit up. I snip roses for jam jars, mouths open as the childs who asked about this world older than unopenable doctrine a bloom of dissonance washed across her face, an opening, a claim. So I'll close with a final poem of mine, Blue Marble. But first I wanna thank, again, I wanna thank Hank and Wendy, and I wanna thank fellow reader, Kim Johnson. Um, thanks also to the Lane Literary Guild, the Eugene Public Library, Friends of the Library and the Eugene Public Library Foundation for supporting Windfall and other community services. And thanks um, to First and Third, my poets from Zoom these last two years, and to you listeners and viewers, wherever and whenever you are. So, Blue Marble. About the trees, I could say they were loudly red and gold until winter descended early that year, her cool, slow breath snuffing bright flames, darkening our corner. On the north side of this periwinkle house, in that sharp sliver between dawn and dusk, I snip hydrangea, tarnished like brass, gray-green wetness of a single bloom shivering against the cold foundation. Imagine a map to this town, wending left or right, south to east, from the Pacific 
the Mackenzie, Mount Tielsen. Use your shy hand to draw a trail through streams and tall trees, rocks and wind. Diagram this place without the interstate or runway stretching the edge. Sketch an honest plan absent the concrete ridge line, false heat below the surface. Name the yellow throat, emerald fringe, genesis for water. Can you answer the world in real time? Take this blue marble into your waiting palm and listen. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you for uh, the very vivid reading mm -hmm. poetry. That was great. And uh, so we're going to have a question and answer period now. And uh, Wendy, have we gotten anything on uh, on the uh, YouTube front, or shall we just go ahead? Yeah, we, we haven't, which is not unusual. We have quite a few viewers, which is fantastic. Good. So All if right. you're out there and you want to still ask a question, please do. Okay. Um, but I know you probably, Henry, have some wonderful things to say. Well, great. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Kim. Um, I, I was struck so much by the immediacy in your novel. Um, and were you conscious when you were writing the book um, of using the present tense? Was that a deliberate choice? Or can you talk a, a little bit about how the present tense enters into the the effects that you wanted when you were writing? Yeah, thank you. And just, I'm still so moved by Kelly. Your 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 poetry is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that um, with everyone. But um, yeah, to answer your question, Henry, you know, especially I, I write a lot of different kinds of things, but mainly around social justice related thrillers um, that are, are ways to engage a reader most immediately. And I think that's particularly resonant for the characters that I write about because so many readers are coming to my story in different ways. And what better way to understand the experiences of, of a young black girl in a family that's um, facing um, incredible challenges that a lot of people have a hard time understanding. And so using the present tense um, first person is, is a way that I, I force readers to be in the head um, of, of my main character. Great, wonderful. Uh, and, and Kelly, um, with, with some of your poems, they seem to be um, sparked by or initiated or inspired by uh, certain current events. Um, would you like to speak to that at all, or? Um, I'll give it a shot. Um, I. It's hard not to be paying attention if you're a writer. I think Kim would have to agree. And Hank, you're a writer, so wherever you, you know you're drawing from all kinds of places. But I think it's not merely current events; it's also history. Mm -hmm. Allergy, you know, social, it's, it's, you know, so it's just, it's a little bit like wearing your heart on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's just, you know, wherever it takes you. Yeah. Uh, as, as a poet, do you, do you take uh, quite a long time with a poem and let it distill over a long period of time or is your composition more immediate and you're done when you're done, or is it a variety of experiences? Yes, a, ver a variety. Um, some things I some things come pretty quickly and some things take years. I did read um, something recently that gave me pause and I have to say I appreciate it. It was a um, somebody suggesting that maybe some poets should write fewer poems <laughs> instead of like, you know, just channel out. It's like, you know, maybe just l let them sit a little longer. And so I thought, well, there's something to that to be said for that too. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is a writing practice for sure. Yeah, yeah. 
it, it reminds me of the discussion that was going on. Uh, uh, I believe it was between uh, William Faulkner and um, Ernest Hemingway, and uh, they were talking about there were writers who were putter outers, and then there were writers uh, uh, that were taker inners. <laughs> <laughs> Which side are you on? You know, um, interesting in that sense too. Um, Kim, uh, I, you know, in that that the section that you read, and this was true for me when I read it on my own. I so much identified with uh, Tracy, and I, I just wondered. I mean, I, I wanted her to speak out in the studio. Um, it, it was. Are you are you happy that that was the effect that it had on me? I mean, I just. I mean, she she paid so heavily for it, and I, I just I'm interested in what you were uh, what you might have had in mind or, or not. You know. Yeah, I really wanted readers to feel her urgency mm -hmm. and um, want to get to know her more. Of why why is she so desperate? that she would attempt to ruin her brother's moment. And is she a horrible person or is there a bigger cause that she's a, that, that sort of connected to her? And, 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 you know, in my writing, and I think it's the educator in me, I, I'd love to use models of um, things that you can apply elsewhere. And, and I do that through the book, through the letters, I do that through the Know Your Rights workshops, through the community center activities that happen. And for that particular moment, I really wanted to model um, how so many times, and, and we've seen it, you know, most recently, um, that you see things that other people do that you don't quite understand. Like, why is someone protesting? Um, why is someone, you know, taking something to another level? And it's because it isn't just about that moment, it's a building of many, many moments um, yes. that forces an urgency um, to use your voice. Um, especially in the moments that you have. And so, um, yeah, I mean, my hope was that, you know, people would, would appreciate her, <laughs> but knowing that maybe some, some people wouldn't necessarily um, connect that first chapter of like, oh, wow, what, who is this person? Um, but they would stick with the story and really learn to love Tracy and, and fight and root on with her as well. Well, I, I'm someone you can see on the street corners holding a sign, and, and I, that episode really put me put me in that particular frame of mind for sure. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, Kelly, I, I I know that your work has appeared in you know the collection like Penumbra, you know, Poems on the Verge, with a collection of other uh, women poets and. And I know that you're closely allied with the first, like you said, the first and third uh, workshop through the guild. Um, how has working with a group of people like that been inspiring and how has it, you know, imbued your poetry over the years? Well, um, good question, Hank. Um, I am um, so grateful for uh, poets in our community um, both the ones who, you know, sit with me around a table or, you know, Brady Bunch style on Zoom, um, because the um, I find that most writers are just really generous with feedback and support and want all of us to, um, to, to write our best, best selves, right? Mm -hmm. And so having that support and honest critique has been uh, foundational for me. And uh, I learned from it. And it's not, only, it's not only what I get back on, say, my own writing. It's what I'm learning by reading other people's work and the great variety of it and, and their different approaches. It's just been um, giving me uh, such an education. I just and it's just enriching, and it's uh, it's also uh, a feeling of solidarity, which is just in, in community, and those are really important because you know a lot of writing is a solitary thing, and to be able to also um, 
collide with people around it mm -hmm. is, um, you know, just really beneficial for me. And I, I can maybe experiencing something similar. It's just, it's wonderful. Well, that's great. Uh, you know, what you said reminds me of something that um, Alice Walker said, which was that she felt every person, every person had a best, best self. Um, and she loved writing about that aspect um, mm -hmm. uh, in her characters. And I was assumed, you know, presumed also in herself as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, Kim, uh, clearly what what you wrote about involved a great deal of research. Would you like to talk to us a little bit about about that? And uh, I know also this this novel was quite a few years experience for you. So I don't know if that involved the research or. Yeah, no, definitely extensive. I think I just love I love to do research in general. And so and, and sometimes it's an avoidance issue to write. So, <laughs> so I did a lot of a lot of um, research and there's some foundational pieces. I think for me, um, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy definitely sparked um, sparked my interest in wanting to capture what the family's experience are, are like for those that have been wrongfully incarcerated. And um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow um, was another um, pivotal um, piece for me. Um, uh, the Devil in the Grove, which actually captures Sergeant Marshall's story. So sort of getting that sort of um, the past to the present, looking at trying to tell the story that um, you could that's present but could also feel like it could be written in any decade was really one of the ways that I really wanted to um, have my story be held but uh, yeah I have you know I did a lot of research related to wrongful incarcerations um, a lot of research associated with um, and I'm not sure if my my wi-fi has gone out on me hopefully y'all can still hear me Yes. Um, but I, you know, a lot of research that um, w is looking at sort of the mass incarceration and challenges with that. Um, um, oh, oh, yeah, there, there, um, there's, there's um, so much that I that I read and I tried to do for me, listing a bibliography in the back of some of the um, the most accessible uh, pieces that, that I felt like people could follow up and, and read on if they wanted to. So, so if you're in a classroom or if you're, you know, an adult wanting to, to pick up a book that you could, you could find that next sort of follow-up piece connected to it. Oh, right. Really. It's really interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, Kelly, you, you, um, yeah, I know that your your poetry seems inspired, you know, by landscape as well as many other things. Um, I, I was wondering, with the Saint Petersburg poem, the place have a particular impact on your on your writing. Um, I just noticed that there was a ver real vibrancy to that, which is in all of your poetry, but it's particularly that one. Mm -hmm. um St. Peter's, that's a poem I didn't read tonight, but I shared with you ahead of time. And uh, it's, a, I, what I'll say about that and, the, and then generally is, um, the, how do I say this? The, the world offers us so much and there's, um, it gets back to paying attention. And I feel like I got to be honest, I feel like I'm in my head a lot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so if I can just l quiet and look, there's so much to pick up. And I've not been to St. Petersburg, Russia. And so, you know, a little bit of research, not nothing like what Kim's talking about. Um, but then putting myself there, um, with with um, it, my emotional self there is is really important, and I think you know that that is true for for many poems. It's just it's sort of it's putting my inside somewhere um, to you know to see it through my eyes, but then see it through through my other senses as well um, mm -hmm. is really important. Great. I think we're we're moving toward uh, rounding it up in terms of questions. So, I'll mm -hmm. ask one more of each of you. Um, 
and Kim, Kim, your novel appeals to actually two audiences. I mean, in many ways, I mean, there's the young adult audience, but you know, I, I know as an a, adult myself reading it, I felt like I was on, um, you know, the right wavelength too. Um, did you find it difficult to write for two different sets of audiences? Um, and by extension, did you find it difficult to project yourself into this, this uh, young person's point of view? Mm-hmm. I think I, I really benefit from having worked in higher ed for 20 years. So I'm always around young people. And so their voice is often with me, um, you know, all the time. And so that, that element was, was easy. And I, and my approach with young people is um, they could handle a, adult uh, situations um, because oftentimes the, the students that I end up working with have a lot going on with them um, and they're they're managing things in a lot of different ways and have had for many years even before they got to the, the level of being at the college level and so um, you know I think that 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 I really balance that with my writing I, I enjoy young adult I mean I that's like the first place that I really go to um, when I'm reading. And so I think it was really easy for me to really balance that line of both. I think the only thing that, you know, I, I hear more from, I say probably my adult readers is those that um, are really into crime fiction and wanted more of a, a criminal procedural kind of a kind of thing. And, and I did have that. It was about, <laughs> about 50 pages of procedural work that, you know, um, my editor smartly said, you know, young adults don't want to read that <laughs> that part about the trial and the appellate court and, you know, all of these things um, that I also find fascinating as well. And so I think it was really trying to balance, um, not trying to tell too much, uh, you know, in, in, in some ways and, and assume that my readers will get the, the gist about sort of what's happening just so I can keep up the, the pace, um, the pace for, for the attention span of, a, of, well, myself too, but for young adult, young adult readers, so. Very good. Thank you. Um, I guess the last question I guess I would have would be, Kelly, um, in a poem like Extinction, mm-hmm. you're, you're, um, you juxtapose some startling images and some startling um, juxtapositions. So like you have the asteroid and yet you, then you have the animals and so on. Is that, would you say that's a hallmark of some of your writing is to kind of have these surprising interconnections um, or is it just something that comes forward to you just kind of in a rush of inspiration? Hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes I, I will say my mind is a bit of a pinball machine. So yes. Um, and what's also true for me is that, um, there is an interconnectedness among, you know, so many elements, um, around us and beyond us. And so, um, my, my only hope is that when I do bring, these seemingly disparate elements that they actually do fit together. Um, and, yeah. if, and if they don't, then I haven't accomplished what I set out to do. And so that is my goal is to, you know, to, to make sense of it. Um, because, um, you know, that, that's part of our living, right, is, is we're simultaneously living with disorder and order mm-hmm. and, and, and making, sense of, making sense of things. Well, thank you both for such a stimulating evening and, uh, and such powerful writing. We really appreciate your being here. And uh, I just want to uh, also say that the next next month, uh, Alan Contreras will be reading his poetry and John Morrison will be reading his poetry too as well. Um, I also uh, want to mention the Tsunami Books Uh, We are very privileged in this city to have actually a literary bookstore. They are a vanishing breed and uh, we are very, very uh, grateful to Scott who runs that that store for, well, not only carrying our books, but also uh, providing space for some of our 
discussion groups. So, um, and that they, they are running a business and it's working, you know? And so they have the phone number there and I know that they carry uh, carry Kim's book because I got it there. And uh, you can get, I'm sure you can get, if if not a copy of Penumbra, which has mm -hmm. poems in it, you can certainly special order it as well. So uh, do support our, our local literary bookstore. So, um, and do we have any final remarks from Wendy? Just my gratitude and my thanks for both of your outstanding readings and for spending time with us tonight. Um, all benefited from it and it was a fantastic evening so thank you both and thank you henry as well oh, my pleasure all right well, well thanks again and we'll thank hope you. to see you next month too and remember uh tell your friends about this reading and and tell them that it's accessible uh, indefinitely on youtube as yeah. well um, um beyond tonight for sure thanks Just come back and revisit it <laughs> it's worth it thank you good night everyone Bye, Kim. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.